doing and offering all of their all of their religious practices towards all that's not God, following all their self-willed ways. Even in this, he comes out and say, "I have good thoughts towards you. I have a good plan. I have a good future for you. I have something wonderful for you." God is. He's almighty. There's nothing outside of his sovereign will. Nothing's happening or around you that, that we have to control or hang on to or pull down or lift up. He is in control of all things and all we need to do is just, yes, Lord, almighty God, it is well with my soul. He's almighty God. Amen? How great thou art. Martin Luther writing that great hymn of long ago. I believe it was Martin Luther. That uh, how great thou art, O Lord. Father in heaven, uh, we're gathered here uh, tonight for, to learn of you, to learn of the Holy Spirit, to learn of the Spirit of the living God in our lives in this world. We live, Lord Jesus, with, uh, with sight that is somewhat blurred. Our understanding is not uh, full. Uh, our knowledge lacks. You remember we're but flesh. We have a, a deposit of the Spirit as of right now, what you called the earnest that is in us, this holy, wonderful new creation in Christ that is growing and maturing, but yet each day battling, every day it's it, the flesh nature, uh, the law of sin in our members, we've got the world tempting us, we've got the enemy attacking us, and yet in all of this, and all these afflictions that abound, you said that you deliver us from them all. And Lord, all we have to do is just call upon Jesus, and you'll be there. All we have to do is just look to our refuge. All we have to do is just hide ourselves in the cleft of the rock and watch you go by. And so, Father, we ask that your glory would be made known in this room with these people, with this night, even right now, that we would all walk out of this room with something more of you in our lives, some new knowledge, some new understanding, an improved relationship, a, a better passion, a, a more intense passion for God in our lives. I thank you, Jesus, and I know I speak for all of us, Lord, that that we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for the breakthroughs. We thank you for bringing humility into our lives and for causing people to grow and to mature in their walk with you. And Lord, once again, we want to pray that self-will would not have its way, but God's will. For we remember Christ Jesus and the Garden of Gethsemane where he was under intense pressure and he said, not my will, but yours. Lord, let that be our cry. Let that be each person's cry. Because we know, Lord, that that's, where, that's what the resurrection is all about. Not my will, Lord, but yours. To live in light and founded on the will of God. Be in this meeting. Help me, Lord Jesus, to be able to, to bring forth this message. Give us ears to hear. A heart that's tender towards you. And let the Spirit of God have free reign always. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, we continue tonight with the Holy Spirit class. The concerns of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we've been going through this um, outline on the... Uh, first, we discussed and went over and lectured on the invisible world, the spirit world, the, uh, uh, how the spirit world basically is made up. Uh, then we went through the person of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. Then we went over and looked at the character of the Holy Spirit, the conduct of the Holy Spirit. Remember, that was the long one as to uh, 43, 42, 43 identifying marks of the conduct of the Holy Spirit. As we discussed, just as his character is played out in his conduct, so our character is played out in our conduct. By the same token, since we have the Spirit of the living God, we're expected to not conduct our own affairs, but rather display the very conduct of God since God's in us. Yes? And we've gone through all of that, understanding that we're saying no to the old character and no to the old conduct, and we're saying yes to the Christ in us, that, that new creation, the Word of God in us, and our character and our conduct must reflect the presence, the manifestation of God Almighty. Someone who says... Well, yes, I, I'm a believer and has a conduct that's contrary to that belief. It's not there. Their conduct will instead display the character that dominates their life. But the Holy Spirit also has concerns. Various concerns. Not concerns, as we talked about last time, not concerns as you and I see concerns. Remember that? That when I say, 
gee, I'm concerned, or you say, or someone calls me or emails and says, I'm really concerned. Immediately, what does that I'm really concerned mean? Worried. I'm, I've, got a, I've got a, either a little worry, I've got a lot of worry, I've got intense worry, but someplace in there, worry, meaning things might not work out the way I had hoped. Right? Worry is things not working out the way we had intended or hoped. Worry is always we anticipate or expect something to develop or come out the way we want it to, and we're worried that's not what's going to happen. So our, our plan usually when we worry is to start making our case and start manipulating and maneuvering and calling and writing and standing fast and they're not going to tell me what to do or something to make sure that things work out the way we have wanted them to work out. Because we're worried. And actually, worry is built on fear. You're fearful things aren't going to work out the way you had hoped. You're fearful that God's not going to come through. I know he can come through, but will he do it for me? Is oftentimes what people get struggled with. Gee, I know the Bible. He did it for David. He did it for Joseph. He did it for Jeremiah. He did it for Isaiah. He did it for Peter. He did it for Paul. But I, I, I'm just Gary. And, uh, you know, all right, well, he does it for the pastor. Boy, I see him all the time. He, but I'm just Arlene. I'm, I'm just Chuck. I'm just, you know, the same spirit, right? But the worry oftentimes is not bringing God into question whether he can. It's will he do it for little old me, Right? And so our worry is instead, we get concerned that he's not going to do it for me. He's going to let me down. Just like every other man, just like every other woman, just like every other friend, just like every... They're going to let me down. He's not going to, he's not going to pull down because maybe I didn't measure up. I, gee, that's right, I blew it yesterday. I said something wrong last week. He's still punishing me for that 10 years ago when I... And I've heard it all. And more importantly, he's heard it all. Because rather than standing on, I love you with an everlasting love, we instead build our lives and our concerns and our worries on the things that we feel we fell short. He's not going to help us. He's not for us. Uh, things aren't going to work out. And the trust level dissipates. Because why? Because we call it all, and see, in Christian worlds, we don't say that I'm fearful. We say, I'm concerned. See? We've, we've learned to hide it. So I, I have a prayer request. I'm really concerned. And inside their heart, they're tick, 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 right? <laughs> because they're, they're just all, all, all saturated with anxiety as so concerned. Well, when we're talking about God's concerns, he's not up there saying, gee, I, I hope Mike and Craig come to Bible study tonight. He, he's not, you know, back there saying, boy, I hope they pray before they eat tonight. I, you know, what, go, what, two thirds of them did. Thank God. You know, he's not. You know, he's not operating. That's not God's concerns. He's not operating with. Gee, I, I've, I've got the whole resurrection planned. I've got the whole kingdom planned. I hope somebody shows up. Man, I'm really concerned. He, that's see his concern when he has a concern it means that's what he's focused on that's his attention that's what consumes him that's where he puts his action his thoughts towards that's what he's after and what he's after to develop or to bring to completion surely will why because that's his concern and there are other things now here's the hurtful part there are many many things that people are caught up and concerned about that sadly to say, and I hate to tell you, he's not. That are consuming your thought life, are consuming where you and I are at, consuming, and I say you, I mean church world, and even unbelievers who are all caught up with expecting God to be concerned for, and that's not where he's at. He's, he's still probably waiting for you to really call upon him in the spirit. And oftentimes, and I've said this, and we just got done talking just before, Sandra and I were just chatting that, and I've talked with many of you about this, is that how many people are trying to get God to come down to where they are and spending all of their energies trying to get him to do what they want done rather than praying and focusing on becoming and going where he is. 
And so many people, less you said it, well, how many people are on a dead horse? And they're, and they're, they're riding that horse. And they're beating that horse. All right? Giddy up, giddy up, come on. I'm saying the right things. I'm hitting it the right way. I'm kicking it the right way. I put the oats out. But if the horse is dead, there's only one thing you and I can do is get off. All right? You got to get off the dead horse. So, and now, and isn't it comical? I mean, isn't it silly? Isn't it, it seem like, you know, now picture this, wherever you're at, and how many people are spending their time and their energy and their money and their focus and their prayer life of all their concerns trying to get the dead horse to get up and go. When instead, if you just started applying yourself, and, I, you know, sadly to say, there's a lot of churches that are in that realm. That they're trying all the programs and they're trying all the things and they're trying to get the dead horse to go. And there's all kinds of people and they're getting together in prayer groups and they're trying to get it to go. But it's, <laughs> you got to get on the, the live horse. you got to get off the dead horse. That's basically what it comes down to. And so in this, wherever you and I are at, we've got to start developing. If God is in us, then he wants us to get off of our concerns and get on to his concerns. Amen? And now... This isn't like, okay, option time. This is just, that's what you and I have to do. Tremendous freedom came to my home and to my life and my wife's life when we came to realize that if we focus and apply ourselves to the concerns of God, then, you know, it's amazing how many things he takes care of for us that we don't have to, that all of a sudden you have freedom over, that because you're focused on, on what God is doing even as pastor of church. That in this, I'm always looking for, with, with, uh, with the Spirit of the Lord, what is he looking to do? Where is his concern? Where is a person at? If, if as pastor, we've talked about this, if pastor, or as any person in here, your whole quest is to make sure people like you. If that's your quest, is to make sure people respect you, people like you, like you, people uh, uh, enjoy you, that's your whole quest, then you're so concerned with self-love, you're never going to get a hold of God's love. You're concerned with making sure people like you to say the right thing. Gee, I better call, I better say, I better write, I better, who's watching? This is a person probably heard, they might better make sure I said it the right way. And we're so concerned with that, even parenting. I've seen so many parents that are concerned with consumed with making sure their children are in love with them and like them as friends and as buddies that they fail to be a parent. When God has called us to first be a parent. And that's what we're called to do. The concern is to not raise children. The concern is to raise adults. We have too many people raising children that when the child turns 20, they're still acting like they were four. Instead, God wants us to raise adults. And more than that, as believers, our concern should not just be to make good kids. Right? But we want kids that are born again, love God. Amen? And your concern is not just to make sure that they come to church and, no, don't get the little Bible, get the big Bible so everyone sees. No, that's, that's not our concern. Our concern is to prepare them to meet the king. Right? The eternal picture is at play. So when we're looking at God's concerns, what was the number one concern that we went over last week? Do you recall? The inner man. God, his, his great concern, not his worry, not his worry, not his, I hope it works out. Hope in Christ Jesus is not the same kind of word that we use in our English language, hope. Our hope is kind of like leaving an element of it may not work out. But you'll notice in biblical literature, hope means it's sure and amen. That you can place your hope in him. There's a surety to it. There's an amen to it. There's an exclamation point to it. You can count on it by putting your hope in him. There doesn't leave a question mark or a doubt there. Does that make sense? So, God's great concern is the inner man. If he's dealing with ministering to because he brought forth an inner man. The Bible calls it, remember we do an inner man. An inner, the inner man, the one 
hid with Christ. We are hid with Christ. Christ has not yet been fully revealed. And right now we're fellowshipping in his sufferings, which we just prayed on Sunday night. We're fellowshipping in his afflictions and sufferings so that we might also partake of his glory when it's revealed. So right now, if we're trying to get ahead of the horse, ahead of things, and get the glory now, then you're on the wrong side of eternity. That's on the other side. You're, we're, that's coming. Right now, we're, our inner man is not seen. What is preventing the person next to you? What is preventing me from seeing the inner man in you? What is preventing you from seeing the inner man next to you? What is, what is preventing you from seeing my inner man? What is preventing that? The flesh. The flesh that you are currently housed in is preventing you from seeing things the way they really are. All we have is our natural eye. So you and I see by faith. We see by faith. So faith sees, understands, and knows so you can start seeing. Do you not see Christ coming alive in certain people? You see it all of a sudden start sparking and a continence change and a, a lifestyle change and a mindset and the way they talk and, a, and their, con their concerns start shifting. Their conduct alters. Their character starts becoming more mature and more like who? Christ Jesus. So you and I start observ observing some things happen. People knew that I was born again before I even knew it happened to me. I didn't know what that was called. I just knew something happened, but I didn't know that it had a, a, a term. I didn't know that there was a, like a biblical language for it. I just knew something happened in my life, and people knew that something happened to me before I even knew how to categorize it. Didn't even know the knowledge of it. So there's something changed in thought pattern, and in, in speech, and, and in desires, and in passion, and in knowledge. So something happened. So the inner man is where we're at. Now, where did we leave off with that? Was it, uh, what, do you have any notes as to where we left off on that? Did we go through conviction, conversion, consecration? Okay. Let's go to uh, um, number two then. As to his number, his second concern. His second concern. <clears throat> number two. He's number one, he's concerned with the inner man. Number two, his concern is the complete man. The complete man. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. Colossians. Small little letter in the back. Colossians, chapter 2. Turn to verse 9 in chapter 2. Verse 9. Which says, For in him, who's in him? For in Christ, in him, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, meaning the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all that God is. For in Christ, the incarnated Christ, in who Christ is, all that Christ is even resurrected, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, meaning in bodily form, he was here and he was among us. Verse 10, and you are complete in him. You are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. He's the head, we're the, we're the body. He's the head, we're the body. The body of Christ. You are complete where? In him. So if we want completion, where must we be? In him. If we desire to have it our own way, we are therefore fighting against our own completion. We are therefore fighting, arguing, battling, defying the very work that God wants to do in our lives. Which is what? To bring us to be a complete man in him. Notice that if it's an inner man, he wants to bring it to completion. The inner man, the new creation in Christ, he wants to bring to a completion. He's out to, to bring it to a, to a fullness. He's out to bring it so that 
uh, that, they, uh, that he's going to furnish everything that you and I need in order to make that happen. He wants to complete that task. Uh, anybody here who has employees or your manager or, your, uh, or even your, your own kids that you've said to go clean your room, right? Don't come out till it's done. Complete. Don't come out till it's done. Then half hour goes by, 45 minutes go by, you go to the door maybe and listen, and you hear, right? <laughs> you hear things moving, you hear, right? And you say, they're not working at it, right? So you open up the door, you knock and look or whatever, and you see that things aren't done. I told you to get this done. Now, what, what do you want them to do? Oh, well, I know it's a late, and I know you want to go outside and play. Go ahead. I can assure you of this, the Holy Spirit will never do that to you. Think of it now. He will never say, well, you've defied me for three months now, and well, I guess it's okay. He's never, he's going to stay on it, and stay on it, and stay on it. And he's not going to make it easier, well, okay, let me come in and show you how and help you. He doesn't make it easier, he makes it harder. All right, you had an hour to do it, now you've got a half hour. Get it done. He's out to bring things to completion. Not as a taskmaster, but as a father, as a parent. Why? Because it's not healthy for you for me to just let you do whatever you want. He, he understands that he's the father and he knows we're not. <laughs> we're the children that he wants us to stop being so childish. Be, be instead be brought to completion. Complete in him. He wants us to have how much obedience? Partial obedience? Complete obedience. Not partial, but complete. He wants to bring us to completion. He wants you and I to have a full understanding and a full complete operation of our place in the body of Christ. So, let's say I'm a hand. So if I'm in the body of Christ, fully mature, but my hand has stayed like Olivia's, my granddaughter's, who's six weeks old, it's not going to fit very well, is it? It's not going to work very well. It's, it needs to come to a place where it can be complete in the body. It needs to be furnished with the, with the blood. It needs to be furnished with the same, with the same uh, nutrients. It needs to be exercised. It needs to be brought to a point. And it needs to be in harmony with the rest of the body. God is out to bring you and I to a knowledge of where you belong and an equipment, a furnishing to complete that task. Does that make sense? And he's not hiding it from you and I. Like many, I've heard many people say, but I don't know where I belong. Usually that's the same person who has not been applying themselves to the humility and following after and seeking after the kingdom of God. Because the love of the Lord, once that starts maturing and developing, and as one allows the holiness to come into one's life, those issues usually end up becoming a non-existent issue. Because all of a sudden you find that all those little things that you're doing all of a sudden take on enormous significance. And he starts leading and guiding you. And the little things start giving you joy that one time we're just, oh, when's he going to do something big? And all of a sudden the little things become big. All of a sudden just helping someone and talk to someone, encourage someone becomes big. Praying for someone in the office and taking someone out for a cup of coffee becomes big because you're doing something as unto the Lord. All of a sudden going to Ghana and hugging a kid all of a sudden makes a big difference. All of a sudden humbling yourself before the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm ready. Do it in me. That there's something moves in the heavens. Something ripples through the heavens. That you and I don't see it all, but something moved in our hearts. And he wants to bring us to a state of completion. He makes it happen. The great cause who never changes is the one who changes you. The great cause in the heavens who causes all things to happen, causes it to happen in you and me. And he brings us to a state of, what's his concern? Completion. Where? The inner man. He's not going to work with the old man. You've heard me say this and it needs to be said. He's not looking to refinish or refine anything of your old nature, the Adamic nature, the nature we received from Adam. He's not looking to refine it. 
He's not looking to replenish it. He's not looking to rejuvenate it. I can assure you of this. He's not going to reincarnate it. He wants one thing out of it. Die. The cross. Suffocate till you have no movement. Arms don't move. Legs don't move. You can't even breathe. The, your own weight will cause you to suffocate under its pressure. That's where it belongs. Why? So that the new man might come forth. The one that he is concerned with. And he wants to bring it to completion. Now, in that same chapter 2, look now of, at verse 8, just before it. Verse 8. And what's, what's it begin with? What's the very first word it begins with? Beware. Now, Scripture does not hide that there's an enemy. Rather, Scripture's the one that exposes his tactics. And one of his first things that he says here to them is, Beware. Be on guard. Have the knowledge of. Now, if we look at, and before we go past that, if we look at verse 10, to be complete in him, you are complete in him. If you, he says, Beware, what is the enemy out to do? To not have you complete. Or, think of it this way, to unravel that which God is knitting together. Think of it now. The Holy Spirit in the womb of, of God is knitting together the body of Christ. And the enemy is out to unravel that. To not bring it to completion. To hinder it. To cause it to be stunted growth. To keep you in a dwarf-like state. To keep you from becoming spiritually complete in Christ Jesus. That you're in the body, but you're inept. You have a dead arm. You're, the body is, just drags your foot around. That you, you just can't seem to accomplish. You're, you're like dead weight in the church because the, the devil has worked in such a way to keep you in an inactive state. And he's out and he says, beware. What, well, all right. Let's, now we just probably just skim right through that. Yeah, okay. Beware! That's what he says, right? Be on guard. Know this. What do, all right. Let's really, okay. Let's, somebody just sang the, 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 rang the bell. Someone just screamed from the watchtower. Someone just blew the trumpet. What's going on? Lest someone what? What, what could happen? Lest anyone what? What are they going to do? Cheat you. Cheat you. Take from you. Undermine. Steal. Cheat. Loaded dice type thing. How could they cheat me? What, what could they possibly use to cheat me? Notice the war of words. The war, the war of thoughts. How can they cheat me? Through philosophy. And empty deceit. Philosophy meaning the things, the, the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world. The wisdom of cults, occult opinions that vary all down through the age. And just this morning I was listening to, uh, I don't know, Good Morning America today. And uh, Shirley MacLaine was on. And uh, Matt Lauer was interviewing her. And he's, he's giving all kinds of accolades of how mature and spiritual, how confident she is. And how wonderful in the inner person she and the insight and the enlightenment she has. All talking about God knows what. All kinds of just star men and UFOs and inner people and uh, the light of the spiritual world leading and guiding and all kinds of words cheating people of what they could really have. And there's, a, there's numerous. PBS, public station, is loaded with them. With all kinds of fine music and violins and all kinds of things. All to make it more enticing for someone to hear the words of deceit. Cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to what? Traditions of men. How many times you've heard even in the past two years that I've been preaching from here, beware, beware, beware of the traditions of men. Vain philosophies, religious practices, rituals, men's traditions of commands and demands for you to do this, for the church to do that, this is the way, and all trying to capture us that we lose the freedom that God has given us in this place. Everything deals with truth. 
understanding, applying, receiving, and following after the truth. And, he, and there's the basic, Lord, look at this, the traditions of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Everything must come from and acknowledge Christ Jesus. So this book all of a sudden becomes understanding God in our lives becomes the way to become complete in Him. If someone says, don't care, then that's what they're going to do, not care. They're not going to apply themselves to know. Hey, all I want is just enough to slip into heaven. I'll tell you right now, that's a devilish thought. Gee, all I want to do is just have enough, know enough. Gee, I know I had an experience with God. I know I'm born again. All I care about is just, can I just, can, all right, I don't care, just give me a back room. I want to enjoy today. I, you know, I don't want you to come back right now. I have things I want to see done and do. And I want to just slip into heaven. I'll tell you right now, he's already got you. The devil's already got you. He's already tempting you with empty deceit. That's an empty thought. He wants all your heart, the complete person. In this, we have to apply ourselves to. Look at chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Now this I say, well, wait a minute now. Now this I say, well, what did he say? Verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 4, now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Persuasive words. He just told us that in Christ Jesus is the mystery of God. In Christ Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. His desire is to bring you to completion. Beware of anyone cheating you. Beware of empty deceit. Beware of the traditions of men. Beware of according to the basic principles of world and not according to Christ. Now, verse 4, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you. How can they deceive me? With persuasive words. Clouds that have no rain. That persuasive words, even now, your mind and your heart should be clicking that either we have a pastor here for the past two years who's just being persuasive and leading you all down the road of destruction, or it's the truth. That when you're reading a book, you're listening to a song, you're watching a TV program, you're, you're, whatever you're doing, something, something should be clicking in your heart, pounding in your heart saying, that's the truth, or that's not the truth, that's not right. And, and all of a sudden you realize saying, and, you re, and there's a rejection. No, I don't want to have that. I'm not going to listen to that. That's not going to be, that's not entering my mind, my heart. Does that make sense to everyone? Is there an amen? So is, is, there, is there anyone bothered with that? All right, so in this, that you and I need to be careful. I like what, what the, um, uh, it says here in um, verse 4, that uh, should deceive you with persuasive words. If I remember right, the King James uses the word beguile. Does anybody have the King James instead of the New King James? Is that the word that it uses in verse 4? Huh? Beguile. Yeah. But enticing words. Be beguile. That's a word that's not oftentimes used today. You know, we don't necessarily use that in our conversation today. But think of it. That, doesn't that sound witchish? Right? It doesn't, it's got the perversion to it. It's got the witchish, the, the witch sound to it. The beguiling. Doesn't it have the, the satanic but see, if we just say persuasive, it just says, oh, well, that's just someone's opinion said strongly, right? But see, the, the, real, the word is like beguile. It's like that sly, enticing, drawing you away from the truth because I'm offering you something better. See what I mean? That, there's a huge difference. It's the sly, crafty, did God really say? See? That beguiling voice that comes across as, I'm concerned for you. Did God really say, hey, I just want to talk to you, I'm concerned for you. You know, remember the serpent with Eve? Say, I, I'm concerned. I think maybe God's holding something back that you need to know that you could be like him instead. Uh, did God really say, I'm, I'm concerned? See? And the devil's voice shows up in a variety of ways with different faces and names. But he's the same one. And he's out to what? Beguile entice with empty promises, deceitful words, 
to persuade you to leave the knowledge and the wisdom that's in Christ, to leave that which Christ is doing in your life. There's been even beguiling voices in this church in the past two years. Beguiling. Anybody yes? Beguiling. Trying to draw you away from the truth. Trying to keep you where you are. People have even heard voices of who do you think that you are? Trying to keep you in your place. Gee, don't you know that you could be doing something else with that money or that time or that... Don't you know that they're not treating you the way that you should? All these little, I'm concerned for you. Beguiling. Careful. It says, beware. Guard yourself. No. And so in this, why? Because he wants to bring us to a completion. To complete us. That's what he's after to do. Look at Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, chapter 4, verse 12, a servant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Uh oh, where? In the will of God. Where's the completion? In the will of God. Where do you find the will of God? In Christ Jesus. All the knowledge and wisdom is in Him. You're not going to find it elsewhere. How many times I've talked about and seen people trying to get the Holy Spirit to come into their realm rather than realizing that no, if anybody's going to submit, it's, it's not going to be Him. We submit to God, not God to us. That is the way it is. He's God and we're not. He's the Christ we are in Christ, in the body. And so in this, he says that he wants to bring us to completion. Tie up the loose ends. Bring everything to, to a furnished, finished state. And remember what Philippians says, I can do all things through Christ who will strengthen me. Strengthen me what? To bring you to completion. The good work I've started in you, what's he going to do with that? Hope you finish it. <laughs> right? No. What's he going to do? Bring it to completion. I am the author and the finisher of what? Your faith. So, now, all the things that you and I get concerned with, he says that he's the author and the finisher of what? What's his, what's his focus? What's his objective? What's his concern? To bring our faith to reality, to bring our faith to fruitfulness, to bring our faith, as we sang just on Sunday, when our faith becomes sight. When we see Him as He really is. How can we see God as He really is? How can that happen? First John tells us. How can that happen? That we'll be just like Him. That's what it says. Well, for that to happen, He's got to bring us to completion. In order for for a, a baby to see its mama, it has to come to completion. He is the same way bringing us to completion. Job said in the midst of his trouble, I wish I had never been born. And not seen this. Well, to see, you have to have a completion. God is out to the author and the finisher of our faith to bring your faith, my faith, our faith to what? To completion. He, he has started a work here in this body of believers. Amen? The proof of it is every week. Every week, somebody's giving their life to the Lord. Someone's breaking through. Someone's arising. Some marriage is getting healed. Something's going on. Something somewhere. Some, somebody, something's happening. We're seeing the seeds and the signs of revival everywhere. Beware. Lest anybody cheat us. Us. The body. They're coming together of what God is doing. Beware, all of us be aware. And you can bet I'm really beware. Because the enemy is crafty. So, instead, what you, you listen to the Spirit's voice and follow him. The sheep, his sheep, says what? Know my voice. I don't need to know all the voices. I just need to know one voice. Doesn't that make our job a whole lot easier? 
my job, I don't have to know all the voices and all the opinions and all the things that are going on and all the laws and all the cults and all the philosophies and, all the, and everyone's personality. All I need to know is his character, his conduct and his concerns and do likewise. It makes my job and your job a whole lot easier. So we follow after him. Why? Because he wants to bring our faith to completion. Turn in your Bibles now to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Oops, wrong way. Just a few letters over. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Everyone there? Verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. It begins with the word all scripture. The revelation, the collected revelation of God in, in written form. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. We don't like that one, right? For correction. Gee, how dare they correct me? For instruction in righteousness. Why? Verse 17. Why? Complete. So scripture has been given and is used and is profitable for doctrine, meaning teaching, for correction, for reproof, admonishment, warning, for instruction, meaning for teaching, in righteousness, that we might be righteous. So why? So that the person, the inner man, the man of God, the inner man, can bring brought to completion. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what God's out to do, is to bring us to a state of completion. We're getting that to the next one. So, perfect. Same word used in other places. The word perfect. Now, in the human nature, when we are messing up and we're caught and held accountable, what is the famous reply? I'm not perfect. Handles all. Now, the Holy Spirit looks at you and says what? I'm out to make you perfect. What I have put in you is perfect, and that which is coming forth is perfect, and that which I'm expecting, and that which is going to dawn in the great morning star of all life when the resurrection happens, it's not going to be, oh man, few flaws. We have to start over. No way. Perfect. Think of it. That which is in you, the inner man, is perfect. Perfect. We don't, we have not ever seen perfect. True. If you think you have, then really open your eyes and look in the mirror in the morning. And it'll dispel all. <laughs> we have never seen perfect. We use the word, but we've not yet known. But that which is in you, not yet fully revealed, is perfect. And he's bringing it to completion. He's bringing it to an end. And the word of God is for its use. Now, look at verse 10 in that same chapter. But you have carefully, look at the accolade. But you have carefully followed my doctrine. Boy, who does he think he is? Huh? Doesn't that sound, who's, who's Paul think he is? You've carefully followed my doctrine and my manner of life. Purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, pers per perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me. What I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Boy, who does he think he is? Because it can sound that way. When the natural man wants to see fault, natural man will find fault. But he's not operating with fault. This is the Holy Spirit saying, follow me as I follow Christ. I've set you a pattern to follow. Paul's writing a pattern. Even my task is to, as pastor, as overseer of this area, is to set an example. That's, that's what God has done. And, and so therefore you, you look to and say, Lord, help me to be, my wife and I, help us to be that pattern. Help us to set that course of action. Help us to, because that's the Holy Spirit. In this, verse 12, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer Persecution. Doesn't that kind of go against many of the doctrines of the day? <laughs> I hate to tell you. 
But if you desire to live godly, gee, I, I don't suffer anything. Maybe that's not the problem. Just go back a few words and maybe there's the problem. So, to live godly, verse 13, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Oh, what's he want you to know? The Holy Scriptures. Why? Because it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that a man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's why. So in this, which you are able to make you... What? What's it say in verse 15? And from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise. Wise for what? For salvation through faith, which is where found where? Christ Jesus. Why? Because he's the author and the finisher of it. His concern, therefore, is to make you and I complete through the Scriptures by the Spirit of the living God to start our faith, bring us through, complete our faith. Why? So that our faith will one day be fully sight and we'll see him as he really is. Why? Because we'll be just like him. Does that make sense? So, when you and I have concerns that go outside of that and we go into our realm of mistrust or pity parties or self-pity and depression and doubt and he doesn't care for me and no one loves me and we go through all of this litany I'll tell you right now God is waiting for you to get on board get off that dead horse and start getting on that which is profitable and that is get into the Holy Scriptures and find out that God so loved you even before even before you yet even knew him that we start recognizing and we start because this is profitable that's what it's all about. We start coming to realize what he's doing in our lives. Amen? So in this, the work of the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, the Spirit of God is working and ministering in us to bring us to the state of completion. That's what he's out to do. Now also, in this completion, he's also looking to bring this completion into oneness. Oneness. When I say oneness, I mean unity. The unity of the brethren, the unity of, of the church coming together. God's completeness doesn't happen outside of the body of Christ. Yes? Right? You've got to be in the body of Christ. You've got to be in Christ. You've got to be in the body of Christ. So a person to be and to be in Christ, to grow in Christ, to be complete and to carry out this complete work in Christ is to also recognize that the completeness is involved in oneness. God, the great, what is called in the Hebrew, the great Shema, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord thy God is one. The Lord is one. Remember when Jesus in, um, prayed in John, the Gospel of John, turn there, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 17. When we're talking about completeness, we have to also remember not only a completeness and a furnishing of our faith and bringing us to a completed end, but the completeness also means oneness. Oneness. And it says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Hey, let's stop right there. That's a whole sermon. Because he prayed for his disciples and then said, with full knowledge of where he's going and what he's doing and what's about to happen, that he's going to send forth the Holy Spirit, because that took place in chapter 14, 15, and 16 of the same book. He's now saying, I will be sending you another comfort. I'll be sending you the helper. I'll be sending you the parakletos. I'll be sending you the Holy Spirit. He'll be coming. He's going to teach you. He's going to take what's mine and teach you all things. He already said all that, and now he's in a state of prayer. And he prays for his disciples, and then he says now in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me. How? Through their word. That's this. That's us. That's you and I, 2,000 plus years sitting in a small little town of Epsom, whose great claim to fame is the traffic circle, sitting in a room at 
almost 8 o'clock at night, with it getting 35 outside and ready to snow in the next month, with all the leaves falling off, heating bills on the rise, and you and I are sitting here waiting for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, learning of Him, because we believe. And that belief is built on the prayer of the Christ. That has been captured, written down, who you and I have tonight and are sharing and enjoying that verse that we would believe. That they would believe from that word that was given. That you and I are here today because the Christ prayed for us. And how many are in this church right now that are here because someone prayed for you? And the only reason they prayed for you is because someone prayed for them. And it goes back and back and back and back and back and back. When I got saved, and I don't know if you're aware of this, and I think you are, that I went to Pembroke Academy right down here the street, down the street. Graduated in 1973. And in 1973, I had bought, and bought uh, three yearbooks, one per year, and by my fourth year I didn't care. And it so happens that, uh, and I wasn't the same person then as I am now, as David. <laughs> so, and when I got saved, I happened to go through my old files. We were in a move, and I saw my old files, and I pulled out, and there were three yearbooks there. And I started flipping through the pages. And people I don't even know, I don't even remember their names or their faces, have little scriptures under their names. Little comments about... I didn't even know you were there. I didn't even know. And I said, how many of them prayed for me back then? That only in eternity will tell, I prayed for you, and now you're in the very area that I live. The, the power, that person's going to, time has separated us, and I, don't, I, I would see them on the street, I wouldn't even know them. But God holds those prayers because they've risen as incense unto the Lord. And our, our, our whole, all of eternity is built on the prayer of the Christ. All of the eternity is built on the prophecies of God. Everything is said and done on the words that have been spoken, the words that have been lived out. The world that we live in is a world of words. Battles go to nations, war against nation. Why? Because of the tongue. Words. It's all words. By your own words you shall be saved or condemned. Words. Words mean something. Well, you know, I'm terrible with words. Get better. Get better. We're called to. And so in this, verse 20, will believe in me through their word. What? Well, look at verse 21 now. That they all may be one. That's what he's after. You can, now I want to show you something tonight that not everybody always gets pleased with. I guard this flock against a divisive religious spirit like, like a hot shepherd. That I'm out to really make sure that we don't get that in here. That, why? Because I want to stay as one. One in the truth. One in humility. One in the spirit. And, 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 and I'm not going to uh, call this one and get that one and appeal to this one just to try to build a body. No way. God's doing something and we're going to make sure we stay as one. And one doesn't mean that we all try to find the lowest common denominator where we can all agree. Which is the way politics are usually done. Which destroys a nation. But instead, truth is our oneness. Humility is our oneness. Holiness is our oneness. The Spirit is our oneness. Faith, one faith, one baptism, one, right? One church. And we don't bring that down to where we're comfortable. Instead, He raises us up to where He is. That's what we're out to do. And whether there be few or many, God has called us to be powerful. Powerful in holiness, powerful in consecration, powerful in the spirit, powerful in our prayers, because the world needs Jesus, and it's not going to happen because we have a cool PowerPoint presentation. 
It's not going to happen just because that, uh, that I decide to wear a, 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 a cloak of some sort and put a white collar on that makes me look uh, now uh, very, very sanctified. Right? It's not going to happen because we have a cool sign or a well-lit building or we, we have higher ceilings because everybody can see the words. It's not going to happen because we put white striped lines out. It's not going to happen because we want this and I want that. And why can't we have a bigger foyer? And can't the coffee be a little cooler? And can't we have a crisper cracker? And, <laughs> and that's what consumes people. Right? Instead, we protect the oneness we protect what God is doing. His concern is that we be one. That's what the Holy Spirit... So everything he endeavors to do in our lives is to bring the inner man to completion in his faith and also that we would be one where? In him. In Christ. Not getting our own way, getting the lowest common denominator where we can all agree, making sure, gee, I'd like to state it this way, but this person might get offended. I don't want to offend them, so I'll say it this way. Oh, my, gee, I've got to be careful on this side. That's right. They, they're concerned with that. Oh, I've got a divorce couple here. I better not talk about that. Oh, this person's not giving. And I better be careful. I better. And that's what happens. It goes around and around and around until finally you're such a man pleaser that the Spirit of God never moves. And it happens with something, now hear me now, it happens with something as simple as, well, how come the pastor, you know, doesn't call me? And how many times I've heard that? How come, you know, you know I, I was sick and they didn't send me a note. He didn't send me a note. No, they don't look at what I am doing, they look at what I'm not doing. And they don't realize that the things that I didn't do there is because I knew, because I was being tested. I knew what was going on. I tell you right now, I knew exactly what the Holy Spirit, I went to even call my wife will test. I even had the phone. I said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I know I'm being tested. I know that there's a, a tempting, an enticement. There's a, there's a desire to bring me under. And if it starts there, where will it end? So I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And so in this, we have to realize that God is doing something and you have to protect in the Spirit that oneness. That, that oneness is not what we want. That oneness is in what he wants. Try to run your own home with trying to give all your kids what they want. And it's not going to happen. Even when we would, I was at Zion uh, teaching and we're in the van. My wife and I are in the van with the three kids. He, the dean wants to bring us out to eat. And he's in the van with us. And he goes, Gary, what do you feel like eating? I said, you know what? I really could go for a, a steak tonight. I feel like a steak and, well, Carol, what do you want? She goes, that steak sounds good. Uh, kids, what do you want? Wendy's. I don't like Wendy's. I want to go to McDonald's. I don't want McDonald's. Let's have pizza. And it all starts. And, and now, well, we could go here and pick up this food over here, and then we could swing over to here. and Right? Because if all of a sudden we're now trying to please just two adults and three kids, can we, try the, can we find a place? How about if we go to the mall's food court and let everybody get what they want? Right? Where there, nobody ever gets really what they wanted. But everybody compromises so that we so-called have a false oneness. Does that make sense? That's not the Holy Spirit. That's man-pleasing. And we're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. You cannot do that. And if you're doing it in your home, stop it right now. It's not the Lord. If you're doing it in your marriages now, stop it. If you're doing it among your, in, in the church with the body, stop it. Because that's not the Lord. The Lord is seeking to bring us into a state of oneness and in completion to bring us together as one in Him. That's what He's after. Look at this now in that same section of Scripture. Verse 16, right above it, verse 16. What's it say? They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. How many times have you heard me say that this world has nothing in him and he has nothing in this world? Just in case you thought that it wasn't in here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that this world, he has nothing with and the world has nothing in him. He says the world hates him. It does. Look around. 
It, the world and worldliness hates him, and the only ones who have been kind to Christ is when any country or people has been dominated by true Christianity. A Christian love, a love for the righteousness of God, for right and for purity, of which the world makes fun of. And even now, is, is dressing up your little ones and trying to turn them into little harlots, trying to turn your, your young men into lusty stallions chasing after every little thing that's out there. Just true. Trying to turn them into all drug addicts and alcoholics and say you're cool if you have sports, beer, and not more girls than one. That's, that's living. Is that not so? But in this, we need to recognize that God Almighty, God Almighty is out to make us one in Him. And it's oneness in holiness and in purity. That's what He's after. And in that same section of Scripture, verse 17, what's He going to do? Sanctify them. How does He sanctify truth. Who's the Spirit? The Spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit of truth is out to sanctify you, the inner man, from what? The world. Pulling away from. I don't have part of. Because he says in that same section of scripture that you're in the world, but I am not of the world. Verse 14. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. I have given them to your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So we come to the realization that God Almighty is sanctifying us. How? By truth. Scripture. Learning of Him. Knowing of Him. Is to come to the knowledge of God. Last set of scriptures I want to show you to, or a couple of them, just real quick. Hebrews 10.25 not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together. What's he want? For us to come together. Do, what's he tell each person? Do not forsake this. Do not forsake this. Do not be the one to let that go, to turn away from it. I've heard from so many people that, well, I can just watch it at home. And I, I, I don't need people. It's not long before that person is a very deceived person. They start picking up weird doctrines and weird things and they start picking up all kinds of, I'll just have a few little people in my home and that, that'll be sufficient. Won't be long before they're going down a road of all kinds of things, of wild things that are what the Bible would call strange fire. But the assembly of yourselves, why? Because iron sharpens iron. Encourage one another with these words. Well, if you're alone, it's pretty easy to, you know, a lot of talking to yourself, that's right. That encourages, it says, do not forsake. In other words, if we do, we're in direct violation of Scripture. Because why? Because the God Almighty wants us to be one. And you're saying separated. Anytime I've watched any of the natural shows on Discovery, and I was just watching one not too long ago, where the young wolves were out for, for, the, for the elk. And it wasn't going after the strong young buck. Right? It was going after the peripheral. It was going after the ones on the edge. The lion, the weak. That's where, that's what they're after. The, the predator doesn't go after the strong, but after the weak. Goes after the isolated. If I chased that whole, whole crowd of, of elk and just kept chasing, chasing, mile after mile, till one of them left the pack. Left the pack. Boom! On it. On it. Terrible sight, but very real. And it's an illustration of what takes place in the spirit world. Coming together. How many times you yourselves have, oh gee, I don't want to go to prayer. I don't want to go to Bible study. I'm tired. It's been a long day. I'm frustrated. I'm just going to take a break. And in that break, you didn't really get a break. You came back weaker than when you came, than if you were to come. True? You end up becoming weaker and the next day is not so good. And I've seen people that, uh, I'm just going to take a break and I'm just going to watch TV all day long. And you call them at the end of the day, how was your day? You know, not that good. It was kind of like, you know, I feel kind of lousy. And just, but if you helped someone and called someone and did something and you came to prayer night and you came to Wednesday and you came to church and, I was, and you leave excited and you talked and you were encouraged and you were prayed for and you're, it's a whole different story. And that's what happens. Don't forsake the assembly of yourselves. A wholeness is what God is after. That's what he's looking to do. And, I, and when you're looking at, let me give you just some scriptures for you to look up on your own. If you're writing these down, write down. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, 17, and 18, verse 20, 
and verse 33, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 and 18, verse 20, and verse 33. Also in that same book, 14, chapter 14, verse 23 and 26. Those verses, if I've got them right, all say, all say when you come together, when you come together, when you come together. Is the scriptures trying to tell us something? When you come together, when you come together, when you come together, I don't need the church. I find them all hypocrites there. I'm just going to stay home. Yeah, we're hypocrites. You're disobedient. <laughs> Scripture says that you would come. You must come. You must be part of. We must be part of. The sad part today is it's tougher to find a body of Christ to belong to that you would walk away encouraged and learn and where the word of God is actually being used to reproof, correct, and instruct in righteousness. Is that not true? It's getting tougher and tougher. So in that, think of this last point. Healing declares completeness, wholeness. The very act of healing is an illustration of God's intent to make us complete and whole. So when you and I pray for the sick, don't just look, and as I've often seen, especially young, young guys, young gals looking, just coming out of Bible college. Remember seeing my students? Uh, they just want that power and that gift and want to be known and the ones that pray over and everything. And, you know, pray instead. Not that you have that gift, but that that person would be made whole. That, because that is an exact illustration of God's intent. That we would be as one. That that which wasn't working, that which our organ was infected, that which wasn't right, that which had a tumor, that which God make them whole, complete. Because that's the intent, that's the focus, that's the objective of the Holy Spirit is to send a message to all that he's in the wholeness slash completeness business. Out to make them one. And healing is a direct act in the natural visible presentation where that takes place. One thing that I find interesting about healing, it removes all evidence. Healing removes the evidence. Whereas, well, show me. Well, <laughs> I can tell you where, how it used to be. Well, show me. It, it, it used to be wholeness, healing, removes all evidence that there was once a problem. God's bringing you and I into a state of wholeness and completion in Him that will one day be the removal of everything, everything that was a problem. And healing is in the business of declaring that now in people's lives. Amen? Praise the Lord. Would you stand before your King? Let's just ask the Lord that he would make us one. Amen? That uh, our faith, remember he wants to bring the inner man to completeness. Our faith, he wants to, uh, to, to make us one. Remember that oneness is in him, complete and holy and pure. He wants to bring us to a state of healing that we are one in him. So Father, marriages, faith that is lacking, misunderstandings, empty deceits, philosophies that are Lord, that we want to be an aware and we want to be aware because, Lord Jesus, we want to know you, the truthfulness of Christ. Let your truth sanctify us individually and corporately. Bring us together. And I believe, Lord, there's many others in this area and community that are desirous of not only just understanding the truth, but to have the spirit of truth operating in their lives with such significance, with such influence, Lord, that they truly find the oneness in Christ that they've been so desiring, so thirsty for. Lord, that we would be that church, that we would be those people, Lord, that just, we don't ever want to be that clique, Lord, that we're just a few people coming together and pride ourselves on what you're doing. We want to share. Uh, we want to see the bread increase, Lord, and feed the 5,000 and feed their wives and children. We want to see it go forth. Lord, we want to see the, the nations fed the bread of life. And so, Father in heaven, we know 
that you can do it, Lord. And, and if you are able to pick the weak and the insignificant and make them mighty, Lord, you can do it with us. And so, Father in heaven, we just lift it all up into you. We ask, Lord, that tonight something wonderful would happen. And Father, I even sense it and feel it right now that you are doing something and ordaining something and you are even commanding something in the heavens to begin. And so, Lord, wherever marriages right now in this body of believers have been uh, hurt or hindered, Lord, that you would bring wholeness and completion and a newfound love in the Holy Spirit in their lives. Lord, wherever financial issues have been holding people back and in and, and, and mistrust, Lord, that they would release it to you and trust you. Father, wherever people's faith has been lacking or misguided, Lord, that your truth would set them free. And Father, we will give you all the credit, the honor, and the glory. We're thankful for all that what you're doing. We've heard various testimonies on Sunday, then on Monday night. And we're just looking for more, Lord, of people who are desiring the truthfulness of Christ. Stir it in their lives. Stir it in us. And make us, Lord, that body of believers that come together and are looking to see people made complete in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Love one another. Love God. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord.